Cool. We're on. Dan Abrahams, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. Thank you for giving up, hopefully, about an hour of your afternoon. Hey, mate. I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be on here. Um, it's uh, very exciting. So uh, good to good to be speaking. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you for thank you. Like I say, thank you for giving up your time. So your nice and simple job title, which I absolutely love, just sports psychologist. No fluff around it. Just straight to the point, and is that's exactly what I like. Hopefully, I can't spell it wrong, which is a my first uh, my first scary moment. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, apart from being a, obviously a sports psychologist, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, a brief background on on you? Mm. Well, as you say, that nice simple title. I'm a sports psychologist. Uh, historically, um, I suppose my journey in sport started as a as a professional golfer. When I left school, I announced to my parents I was going to be the best golfer in the world. That plan, as you can imagine, didn't. Uh, I didn't pull that one off. Um, possibly became the worst go- uh, professional golfer in the world, um, <laughs> largely because of what was going on between my two ears. I had a certain amount of ability, but was just you know, always fascinated with the um, mental side of of golf and then eventually of, of sports in general. So I, I, I played tournament golf, won no money, uh, started to coach the game, did my PGA qualifications, my coaching qualifications. And as I as I was doing that, I think I fell in love more with the psychological side of, of, of sport. And coaching golf is great because it's one of those you know, it's one of those professions whereby you're doing it for 40 hours a week. It's just nonstop. So you, I suppose you, you build up experience uh, in psychological processes and practices, you know, within your coaching practice. Um, So um, as I was coaching, I was reading psych books and I just decided, you know what, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to university and I did my first degree in psychology. Uh, I did my my master's degree in sports psychology and then came to a bit of a crossroads and was like, well, am I going to stay a, a golf coach and have the sports psych on the side or should I go full on sports psychology? So about just over 15 years ago, now 16 years, I um, transitioned into being a full-time registered sports psychologist and um, it's it's been a sort of a snowball from there. Um, I've held various positions. I was lead psych for England rugby, lead psych for England golf. Um, I've worked with a number of Premier League clubs. Um, I've worked across all sports, but all, it would always perhaps suggest that I specialise in, in football, soccer, um, that is, and, and golf. Um, but I work across all sports. Um, I've written four books that I'm proud to say have been um, gl- have sold very well globally. And um, I have my own podcast, uh, Rob, not to rival yours, but it's called The Sports Psych Show. And so I, I enjoy hosting that. Uh, and so, yeah, life is a mix of consultancy, podcasting, blogging, authoring. Um, and I think I said consultancy. So, yeah, that's what I do. It always makes me slightly nervous when there's a fellow podcaster on. I feel like I'm being judged. I am. I am like judging you massively. No, I'm, I'm. I'm just picking up tips right now as we go along as to, to, to how I can improve my performance. No, likewise. likewise. <laughs> so, would you say, given given the conversation that we had at the start before we hit record, would you say that sports psychology, given the interest and publicity around mental health and player care? Would you say sports psychology is its kind of height at the minute in terms of interest around what, what you guys do? As you alluded to, we had a conversation off air, so now I have to go into my... Uh, my, my uh, now, when you press press record, I'm like, okay, I've got to formulate uh, an answer that doesn't upset <laughs> anybody. Now, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be straightforward with it. Look, I, I think that... I think we're moving in the right direction. I mean, there's no question. I mean, we're recording now. The, the Olympics and the Paralympics have just finished, and there's been some wonderful stories emanating from both of those two incredible sporting events that has demonstrated that... That you know, within um, this, within the the, the 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 performance sporting landscape, um, there's a lot more care and attention around uh, certainly player well-being, player welfare, um, competitor and participant mental health. Um, so that's great, and and the narrative is changing for the general public as well. Whether it's 
you know, Simone Biles or anything else that came through from the Olympics and the Paralympics, there were a lot of very interesting stories um, whereby the general public are being exposed to this narrative of, oh, these people aren't just machines and robots and they're human beings and there's much more nuance and subtlety as to how we develop these champions, these podium medal winners, these, these participants. So I think that's great. That's great news. I think that I'll throw a word of caution in and I'll throw a word of caution in for the world of sports psychology and it's just my opinion and there would definitely be sports psychologists out there who might disagree with uh, my concerns here but I just think in sports psychology we need to continue down the path of educating our consumers that's the participants the competitors the coaches the key stakeholders in organizations what it is sports psychology is and what it offers where our qualifications lie where our competencies lie where our ethical practices now Something I always, when I sit down with an organization or a head coach or manager and start talking about what I can offer, I'm always keen to start explaining to them, look, when we're dealing with the the landscape of people and their psychology, we're essentially looking at three levels, in my opinion. Okay, Some people would say two levels, but I think it's useful to look at it from three levels. I think we can look at the surface level as the performance psychology piece. That's the, uh, the the mental skills, the teamship, the leadership, the psychology related to coach practice, the environmental stuff like psychological safety and having a mastery orientation, the motivational piece, the behavior change piece at the surface level. That to me is performance psychology stuff. And that can be worked on with individuals, uh, with teams, with coaches across the organization. That, to me, is performance psychology. Now, underneath that, and, and, and one thing to add there is, I always like this term of we're stretches and we're not shrinks, you know, when it comes to performance psychology. We are, we're stretches. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's not people having a, a problem as such. It's just about helping people understand coaches players key stakeholders understand the psychological theories the empirical evidence what works in practice to help them be the best that they can be and we'll talk more about that over the course of this hour underneath that to me is the welfare and the well-being piece i think that's the day today management of thoughts and feelings and emotions and bodily sensations and behaviors and habits which just your your normal population probably for want of a better term have to deal with unhelpful thoughts and feelings and and um, uh, emotions nothing too psychopathological just normal unhelpful perhaps negative perhaps a little bit destructive thoughts feelings emotions and behaviors and and so i i think a sports psychologist can be involved there and i think having a a, a systemic viewpoint across the organization related to how do we best do welfare and well-being is important i believe that lies under the performance psychology piece and i definitely think that some of the things that we do at the performance psychology level filter can filter down into the welfare and the well-being piece in my opinion then underneath that i think you've got the mental health piece again just my term for this my belief on this then i think we're talking more about the psychopathological the disordered stuff not just the low mood and the low mood might come under the well-being piece but the clinically depressed piece the the lifelong depression the the disorders such as eating disorders and personality uh, disorders that really um it's the domain of the clinical psychologist and that's where i would uh, refer on to a clinical psychologist because i don't have the competence to help people when we're dealing with that kind of uh uh, uh, level of, of of need and requirement again it's not to suggest that performance psychology practices and welfare and well-being practices can't filter down into the mental health piece so i think we need to divide it up into that and, and, and one thing to add here rob is i actually wonder on a very simple 
uh, on a very simplistic notion here that you can have a traffic light system. I think across the organization, across the team, that that performance psychology piece needs to be the green light. I think we all need to be invested. I don't think that that's an embarrassing piece. That's us all in trying to be the best that we can be. It's about having shared mental model around models around mental skills. It's about introducing a psychological safety so we can actually be honest with each other, express vulnerabilities and have more involvement in that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff we can talk about there. I think the well-being piece is more of a, an amber light where let's say a player can come over to me, can sidle over to me and go, Dan, I've just got some challenges at the moment and I don't really want to talk about it with the coaching stuff it's nothing major but it's just a couple of things I want to chat about and it might be as a practitioner I might say to that player hey why don't we go and broach this subject with the head coach or with one of the coaching staff because I think this is important to do so given your circumstances that's the amber piece and then I think the mental health piece is that red light that, that's where you know some real you know, obviously confidentiality, confidentiality can be seen across all levels but certainly that that red piece is that confidentiality uh, piece so that's I, I just think that whilst things are getting better we do need to keep an eye on these different levels of what sports psychology can offer and 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 potentially if we're dealing with large sporting organizations that these organizations need to have the right systems processes practices in place that covers all three of these in my opinion one, one of the first things you said in that in that answer was around education and that brings you back to my experiences in academy football when budgets are super super tight there's probably well there was one strength and conditioning coach slash sports scientist and that was me and there'd be plenty of people out there listening who were exactly in that in, in that same exact boat there's potentially someone who's in a day a month a few days a year from a nutrition side and they come in and do their thing again from experience we had a, a psych who did exactly the same and they did their session it was an hour and the lads got involved and really enjoyed it and that person would disappear but and i would be off doing my own thing i'd probably have a different group but when I reflect on that, because we were never going to have enough budget to have a full-time nutritionist or a full-time psych, would the time be better spent actually educating me from a psychology point of view or a nutrition point of view? Because I'm there every day. The, the staple, what seems to be now, is a strength and conditioning coach or sports scientist or often one and the same. It's not the other way around with a psych and a, and a part-time consultant S&C, unfortunately. So would that, from an education point of view, what's your opinion on that kind of situation? I'm guessing that's probably happening at clubs and organisations around the country. Would my alternative potentially offer a better alternative to what is currently being done? And that's not to say that in time, those people like a nutritionist or, or a psych would be would get more hours and get more expertise in the building. But whilst budgets are tight and time is a premium, the better time is actually spent educating the staff versus one-off sessions or sessions a few times a year. Where do I start there, Rob? I, I, for, I mean, I think the first thing to say is I absolutely agree. I mean, I think from a pragmatic perspective, you know, every um, context is going to be different. And when you're talking about contexts that have limited resources, it's how can we introduce this in the most pragmatic way in, in a way that um, um, helps us get the very most out of offerings from sports psychology given the level of resources that we've got I would actually argue that even at the very highest level where you may even have full-time members of staff I think a sports psychologist first and foremost should be working with and through coaches um, in any case um, that's not to suggest that at the very highest level where there's lots of resources that sports psychologists shouldn't be given the license to actually wear boots, be on the pitch, uh, be on wear sneakers and be on the court uh, or uh, or on the course with competitors. I think that's very important as well. Again, it will depend on what resources um, an organisation has. When you're talking about organisations with limited resources, then with and through coaches, with and through full-time and even sort of part-time, half-time staff, if you like, absolutely vital. Um, there's no question 
that when you're dealing with such organizations with limited resources, there are going to be limitations, full stop. There are limitations as to what you can do, as whether it's a strength and conditioning coach or a sports scientist uh, or a coach, you know, him or herself. There's limitations because ultimately you're not, you don't have an expertise in that area. It's just I can come along or somebody else, another sports psychologist can come along and help you make more sense of the biopsychosocial landscape. Um, and I think that I would argue in many respects, that's what I am, whether for players or for coaches. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sense maker. I'm a sense giver. And I firmly believe that, you know, if you as a strength and conditioning coach, if you came to me and said, OK, Dan, I, I'm going to I'm going to put some resources to my own development as an S&C practitioner because uh, and I'm going to give them to you and and, and uh, or I'm going to use them on, on your service. And I want you to help me be a better deliverer of the biopsychosocial component in the gym and out on the pitch when I do my stuff with players. Um, I, I think that's a great thing to do. And what we would do is we would start to make sense of biopsychosocial for you, for you as Rob Pacey, for you as Rob Pacey within the context that you work in, with the people you're working with. Um, I would try to help you to organize that information. You know, what would you do? How would you strive to motivate uh, the people in front of you? How would you introduce mental skills? Um, into that relationship? How would you develop relationships with your the people that you're coaching? What about your self skills? How are you engaging in behavior management if you've got somebody who's struggling to adhere to the kind of pra processes that you're putting in place? And so on and so forth. So I, I absolutely think that limited budget within uh, uh, with and through coaches, helping them to make sense of their specific challenges in their specific landscape. I think that's absolutely number one over and above me standing in front of players the vast majority of the time, which doesn't, doesn't, I could still do the odd thing. It's just, it's the most pragmatic approach. One thing that I just picked up on is the fact that we are differentiating sports scientists and strength and conditioning coaches, which probably 20 years ago, you had a fitness coach. Mm. And then it went to a fitness coach, often became a sports scientist. Then the sports scientist then kind of divided again into sports science and strength and conditioning. I'm just thinking, going back to the first question and the first answer that you gave... Is sports psychology on that same track, given the three layers that you spoke about, but just a little bit earlier? And 10 years down the line, we will have a performance psychologist. We will have a mental health practitioner in an organization. Again, whether it is the part-time role or the full-time role. And we have that level in between as well. Do you think that's where we're, do you think that's where sports psych is that, or is that too simplistic and me trying to no, put I'm... two and two together and make <laughs> make, make ten? <laughs> that would be good mathematics. Um, uh, Rob, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think you're definitely as look as a as a sports psychologist, you're definitely going to orient towards something that you love and you prefer within your your profession and all professions are broad aren't they and biopsychosocial is broad and I happen to I mean I'm a sports psychologist who is really and I suppose it's my coaching background and playing background is I love I love coach science uh, coaching science and I love skill acquisition I wouldn't necessarily suggest I'm an expert on those but they're a part of what I can engage in conversation with and recommend some things in my practice. I had somebody say to me uh, as a sports psychologist, oh, well, you're not a technician. I, Sorry, I absolutely believe I am a technician. I believe that, I mean, when I was with uh, at England Rugby and the great skill acquisition coach, Rick Shuttleworth, Dr. Rick Shuttleworth, you have a lot of conversations with him by the side of the pitch, watching Eddie and the guys coach. And, you know, he, he, he said, and this was nothing to do with, you know, what we were experiencing at England Rugby at the time, but he said he felt in the future we would both be wearing boots and we would be on the pitch doing our stuff. And actually, when you think about it, 
depending on what you're engaging in as, in, as a practitioner, um, that could be absolutely vital for me to get in there and remind a player of the mental framework that we're working on. You know, just as simple as reminder to use their self-talk or to be in their game face, which is a, 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 a technique that I've devised or anything like that. Wow, that's powerful. Even to have the ability to go on in there and address players in their drinks break as a sports psychologist. I mean, how? why would you not... Why would you not want your sports psychologist to do that? That's where the action takes place on the grass. That's where you might do your best work. Now, that's not to suggest that a sports psychologist can't, who's gone through a certain route can't say, you know what, I, I am best served doing the mental health piece, um, player welfare and well-being. I have a, a good knowledge of the performance psychological side, whether that's teamship, leadership, mental skills, etc., um, effective pra- ways of uh, practice, training, uh, etc. Um, they might have a knowledge of that, but they might feel most comfortable, most curious, and often most if they feel they offer best value at that um, away from the pitch, in the clubhouse, talking about mental health working on mental health, working on those practices and uh, and putting those systems in place. And that's absolutely fine. So I think there's going to be individual differences and personal preference there. Um, I just think that as, as sports psychologists, we've got to, because we deal in an industry, and we spoke about this uh, offline, didn't we, Rob? And, and, and I think we probably agree that all industries have this, that there are different approaches and there's different types of qualifications in all industries and one person over here on the left hand side will say the person on the right hand side isn't qualified and the person over on the right hand side will say the person on the left hand side is too scientific and so on and so forth and 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 so there's debate i just think that i'm a sports psychologist i'm hcpc registered i want us to galvanize and say this is what we offer this is how we go about it these are the range of range of offerings biopsychosocial is broad these are the range of offerings and i i as a practitioner can offer this range but i specialize here i think that's a useful conversation to to have and a useful way to go about what we do i'm just going to bring that little bit to an end and that's really interesting however there's lots of other things that i want to chat to you about so i've got no segue there i've got no segue here at all but i just want to make a jump Mm. to something that you'd mentioned on one of your linkedin posts which i always do a bit of stalking to to formulate the discussion that, that we're going to have on a podcast and it's amazing when there's someone like you when there's just so much to go at there's the there's the people that you just don't hear of and you know they're doing great work, but you've there's just nothing out there to kind of work with, and it's uh, I'm formulating myself. But then there's yourself who put so much out there for free. I've got so much to work from. And one thing that caught my eye, given the the audience of this podcast, which is predominantly strength and conditioning coaches and, and sports scientists, and one of the articles was you can't coach effort and energy. That caught my eye, obviously, given my background and and, and the audience itself. And just to ask you about tangible ways, firstly, why do people say that? And secondly, have we got any tangible ways that coaches can positively influence effort and energy? You're taking a drink. I can see you, you're formulating something that <laughs> gives us a big answer. <laughs> yeah, over to you. What's your, what's your thoughts? Oh, where do I start here? Yeah, I've made it my mission. I suppose probably annoyed some people on the way. Um, do you know those posters you see out there? And um, I mean, it's a bit, well, it's a bit like the posters you see out there. Ten things that um, ten things that require no talent, and then it just lists ten things that are clearly competencies and skills that some people, um, are, are, whether through Bi- biology or through uh, a mix of bio psycho social reasons have actually developed over time uh, and actually can be construed as talent listen I- i've kind of waged war at this 
I don't want to say North American because that's so harsh because I think it can be British as well. But you, what tends the message that tends to emanate from some of the colleges in the US, please excuse that. I just that's where I think I've seen it most is you can't coach attitude effort and energy so I'm going to add the term attitude in there as well you can't coach attitude and energy you've got to bring attitude effort and energy to the court with you or to onto the field with you you can't um, as you can see a lack of American accent there Rob because I can't do one but (laughs) there's just a there's just this claim and I, I just you know um why did we hate why did so many of us hate school so many of us hated school because thinking is hard. Uh, it, thinking eats away at the glucose and the sugars in your brain. It takes effort. It's uncomfortable. And I think sometimes things evolve over the years. Um, sayings, approaches, uh, um, um, rise, evolve, emerge over the years that help make our professions uh, uh, try to make them simple try to make them easier Um, and and I really think that's the only reason I can think that that kind of thing exists which is I as a coach coaching is historically we've been very much socialized into the X's and the O's or the well how do we safely lift weights um, what's how do we uh, create the best exercise program according to this person who's standing in front of me according to their body shape that's my very basic idea of of strength and conditioning for example okay very crass I know but we that's the x's and the o's of strength and conditioning essentially we're, we're socialized into this and that becomes everything learning principles of play I want to be like Pep Guardiola I've got to learn my principles of play I've got to learn my game models and so therefore the narrative around the complex biopsychosocial elements becomes simplified uh, to the point of fiction Um, and, and, and I think that coaches need to spend far more time considering those elements and really I think it's the engagement piece how do we engage people how do we engage them for the duration of our sessions engagement as in how do we get them to pay attention how do we get them to retain a sense of attention on the task at hand how do we get them to retain uh, a level of intensity and optimal intensity if you like and I think if we're going to add the word um, attitude in there how do we get them lifting or um, engaging in their task with positive intent you know um, rather than with inhibition so I'm almost darting onto mental skills then attention intensity and intent I think that is a big part of the skill of coaching I'm not going to say it's only the coach's job, but if we're going to be great coaches, if we want to be the best that we can possibly be in what we're doing, whether it is a coach out on the field, whether it's an S&C coach, for me, we've got to engage people and we've got to help them to sustain that engagement so they can learn and sustain that engagement so that they can perform. I think that's absolutely a part of what we have to do does that make it tough does that make it challenging absolutely I suppose it makes it coaching one of the toughest hobbies or professions that you can engage in that's maybe our privilege that's maybe our burden but it but it is and it and and it is extremely tough and we're not going to get it right all the time that's okay that's part of the fun we're going to fail at times we're going to lose players we're going to make mistakes you know we they're going to um, be distracted at times they're going to drop off with intensity um, they're going to be inhibited some of the times that's okay you know sometimes the attitude effort and energy isn't there we can't always blame ourselves at coaching but we do have to look at ourselves we do have to look at ourselves so therefore the question is well, well how how do we do that and wow you know Rob, I mean, there's so many things. <laughs> there's so many things uh, to say there. You can start. I always say st- coaching starts with self skills. I think coaching starts with with self skills, um, self awareness, self control. You know, who am I? Who am I in the gym as a strength and conditioning coach? How do I hold myself? How do I greet my athletes? 
what conversations or lack of conversations do I engage in and engage them with? What kind of atmosphere are they walking into when they walk into my gym? And it doesn't mean that there is only one way. It doesn't mean there's only one type of atmosphere. It doesn't mean there's only one type of personality trait that matters. We don't all have to be extroverted, warm and gregarious. And for many athletes in our environment, that might put them off. That might intimidate them. That might be uncomfortable for them. Can I be a chameleon? Can I orient myself to the individual differences within my environment? Is that something I'm challenged by? And that's a a point of growth for me. How much shift can I get there? So I I, I, I think it starts with self skills. Knowing yourself, taking charge of yourself, and then maybe having your own development plan around that. How can I influence attitude, effort, and energy better from a, a personality perspective, if you like? And then we can move into environment, can't we? The environment that you, can, you, you create um, in terms of, am I offering psychological safety? It's difficult for or challenging for an athlete to walk into a gym and have the kind of attitude we might want them to have to engage with effort and energy if they're intimidated, if they don't feel that they can be their authentic selves, if they can't share vulnerabilities, perhaps. Maybe if they can't participate in their own scheduling. So are we offering psychological safety that notion of offering participation and offering the chance to be and express vulnerability. It can also, from an environmental perspective, relate to the motivational climate. I think that, you know, what we know in psychology is the landscape there is complex, that if you take motivational climate as either ego-oriented I want to get big. I want to get strong. I want to. I I I, I want to be in a gym because I want to beat others, or task oriented, which is much more about being self referenced and engaging in tasks related to the self. Then um, what we know is probably a healthier and safer motivational climate is towards the task, but that's not to discount the ego orientation. Um, so a mix of motivational patterns could be useful. So are you are you aware of that? And I, I, I do think that kind of thing influences attitude, effort and energy. If we can help somebody be engaged with their tasks, then you're going to find them perhaps having a better attitude, a more helpful uh, attitude and engaging with effort and energy. So I think environment makes Uh, a difference your coaching practice makes a difference in terms of feedback when you feedback how you feedback volume style tone where you're getting players to focus their attention so nick winkleman who i who uh, i'm guessing has been on your show so you know he borrows uh, as an athletic uh, coach he borrows from the work of gabriel wolf uh, and um, focus of attention being a mediator of developing skill. And I think even that stuff can make a difference to attitude, effort, and energy. You know, how you engage players from a focus or people from a focus perspective, it makes a difference. What I can say as a sports psychologist is that mental skills absolutely makes a difference to attitude, effort, and energy. If you're teaching somebody about self-talk, um, if you're helping helping them understand or learn about their optimal mental state, if you're helping them understand, you know how um, just very simple uh, bodily cues uh, can make an in, can can influence how one feels. Those kind of little things make a difference to attitude, effort, and energy. 
Um, and so I just think there's a whole raft of things that practitioners, whether they're a coach out on the pitch or whether a coach in the gym, can look to to influence attitude, effort, uh, and energy. And I and I suppose as I, as I'm, I'm I'm thinking as I'm speaking, uh, you know, just even just a basic goal setting process, um, engaging uh, people in um, a basic sort of uh, process oriented goal setting um task whereby they've actually got tangible things to focus on to strive to achieve uh short-term goals to strive to achieve processes to focus on that are going to help them get there even something as basic as that can help influence attitude effort and energy it's all thrown into the mix i suppose the last thing to say there is you can you can coach attitude, effort and energy by just having a conversation by, with the person in front of you. If you feel they're low energy, uh, if you feel their attitude is poor, um, if you feel that they're low on effort levels, just having a conversation using a scaling protocol, for instance, you know, on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being incredible, at, uh, incredible attitude, effort and energy, one being awful, um, where do you think you are now? And offering up your own experience of the situation, I think you're down at five. I think you're down at five because of this. This is what I'm noticing. If I see this, this and this, then I think you'll be up at seven and eight. Can we work on that? Just using little things like that can actually help you to manage effort, attitude, effort and energy and help the people in front of you manage effort, attitude and energy. If I can say those three words. So it's interesting that you say about coaches and the inability to coach effort and energy, which is what I brought up at the start. And it, it's also interesting that you use the American collegiate system. Again, one of many examples, just a pretty obvious one as a as a Brit looking in from looking in from the outside. But clearly the athletes, probably in question that we've both seen on social media or whatever it may be, clearly buy into that notion as well that this energy and effort has to be has to be brought for every session and has to be and again this is from a Brit so I don't particularly want to offend anyone I don't want to offend anyone it seems that that is whether it's there or not it's there on the on the surface so how can we reframe that kind of situation into a more authentic one that we can actually create an environment for the individuals within that team or within that squad or within that playing group versus this one that is almost been forced upon, upon we're forcing upon them and it's probably been forced upon mm -hmm. us as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, I, I do wonder if it starts with... The, the the philosophy the attitude of the coach I, I think attitude effort and energy starts with the coach actually saying from the outset if I was a if I was an Ameri you know if I was a college coach um, and there's many brilliant college coaches let, let's be really really clear about this from what I know about psychology let, let let's be clear let, I suppose let's strip this back. Um, because this is it's quite a challenging question to, to, to answer. And I think that this is why we've oriented into a world of, and it's not just America, it's it's everywhere, of where well, you've got to bring the attitude, effort and energy. Is that, well, it, it seems the obvious thing that the player's got to bring it and I can't help you with that. But it's understanding that human beings are human beings. You've got human beings in front of you. You haven't got machines. Um, anxiety happens to a human being low mood happens to a human being they don't do these things on purpose a drop in confidence happens to a, a player a person doubt happens worry these things emerge through body sensations through feelings through emotions through thoughts being able to manage these human qualities is enormously challenging for any individual there are some who are better than others. Maybe they're a bit more high conscientious. 
Uh, maybe they've been they've grown up in an environment where they've been fortunate enough to be shown tools that have helped them become more resilient. Maybe. But just because somebody has a lot of skill in their hands or their feet doesn't mean that they're able to self-regulate. And so if I stand there at the beginning of a semester, the beginning, if I'm a if I'm a freshman and I hear from a coach, you've got to bring attitude, effort, and energy. You you can control that. It's like, well, hang on, I'm a human being. Now that doesn't mean I there's no accountability. Of course there is. Of course there is. But the craft of coaching, the craft of coaching is having the capacity to influence behavior, to help people manage behaviors, to help them learn and grow as people. You can't just dismiss that side of things and say, well, I'm just here to show you the X's and the O's. You're the one who's got to bring the attitude, effort and energy, which isn't to say that players should divorce themselves from attitude, effort and energy. Mm. Can you see how we've got to hit the center mm. ground? We can't be too far over here. And we can't be too far over there. A way to look at it from, if we're looking at psychological theory, is that the, that ideal position is could be described within locus of control. That the coaching staff have an internal locus of control and the playing staff, the players, have an internal locus of control. As in, they all see themselves responsible for their attitude, effort and their energy and each other's attitude, effort and energy. There's a collaboration. There's a collaborative spirit there. That doesn't mean that the coach isn't in charge. It doesn't mean that there's not top-down instruction and top-down processes. But it does mean that we accept people for being human beings and accept there is a human challenge from an attitude, effort and energy perspective. And to me, from the outset, you've got to engage in that nuance, that complex landscape. It is complicated. It is complex. And I think you make things worse by simply saying, oh, well, you've got to control your act. You've got to bring this to the court. Well, yes and no. And so the practices that I engage in as a coach, the tasks I create with the appropriate conditions can influence attitude, effort and energy. The activity I start with is going to influence. Why don't I start with an activity that engages body and mind? Not just the body, that warm-up, that SAQ warm-up, but also the mind. A fun activity, maybe. Or maybe something that gets players thinking or communicating. Something collaborative, perhaps. Something that is actually going to turn up the volume of attitude turn up the volume of effort, turn up the volume of energy. What about coach feedback from the outset that has players starting to picture and consider what 100% in attitude, effort and energy looks like to them and maybe has them share that with their mates? You could do that for the first minute or two of a session, engage them in mental rehearsal. And teamship, a teamship process as well. What about players share what they're striving to achieve in that session? Again, you're going to turn up the volume of attitude, effort and energy because that sharing holds them accountable to the kind of deliberate practice that they want to engage in. I think that can be coach driven. Right, everyone, we're going to share what we're trying to achieve today. I don't think that's time wasted, even if it's five minutes. Because when you don't do things like I'm talking about, then you compromise on engagement. You compromise on learning. And maybe then you compromise on performance. Um, and I just do think an overarching principle here is a landscape where coaches perhaps need to be Um, more familiar with the capacity to co-create solutions. 
to have players more involved. That is not to suggest that coaches can't drive their program. It's not to suggest that they don't lay down the ground rules. It's not to suggest that they're not the overarching voice. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is whether it's you describe it as this generation or whether you describe it as we know more about how to engage human beings now and that probably includes some kind of autonomy supportive practice. It probably includes um, meaning, that what we're doing has to mean something to the people in front of us. Then that probably demands that as coaches, head coaches, that we have to co-create some solutions, some practices. We have to listen to our people because if we don't, they become disengaged. They drop in attitude energy and effort. So those are the kind of things that I think that create the shift, but it does start with we're all in this. Maybe it starts with a a leveling off of the hierarchy slightly there. Um, That's again not suggesting that everything has to be servant leadership, but and it's not to suggest that the coach is an expert or it isn't an authority. But it is to suggest that we have to be new, more nuanced in our coaching delivery. One thing I want to put to you, because I know we've, we've pushed a little bit for time, but the next 10 or 15 minutes will just take a, a little right turn. But it's something that's, that's pretty a, a thread running through the last 40, 45 minutes. And that's the building of relationships with the athletes that we work with. And this is something that gets talked about a lot in the strength and conditioning sports science community. They don't know, they don't care how much you know until I know how much you care type of mantra. However, I'd like to get some thoughts from you, if if possible, on how coaches can actually go about doing that. And the reason I ask is that I had a, some that I worked with and he was working with a rehab group and what you can do, obviously, as you know, with the rehab group, keep everyone kind of tight knit. It's often small. It's kind of we're, we're all in this together. We're pulling through, working day in day out to to a common goal, which is getting back on the pitch. And they used to go out once every once every week to Nando's, and they'd all be together and they'd love it. They'd look forward to it. They'd see how many hot chicken wings they could eat and all that kind of thing, and it was great. But as soon as they went back to the playing group that was kind of gone and and, and left and, and done and it was they, they were off and then there was a new group of unfortunate rehabbers who were going to be going to Nando's every week but that made me think is that too much is that too much a relationship to too deep a relationship to go out with food to go out for food with your players then you go in okay where are the boundaries how much relationship do I get with the players how close do you get do you see him on a night out and you're hugging and taking pictures? Or do you go, don't know who that is, nothing to do, nothing to do with me. So we've been taught to get, we've been told to build relationship with players, but that, I suppose, moving target of how deep that relationship has to be to get a positive reaction. And just based on that overly complex little monologue, I'd love to get your uh, your thoughts. I think if it's a complex monologue, it's because, again, it's a complex landscape because you're dealing with people. And there's a lot of individual differences out there. There's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of individual differences. And as a sports psychologist who's worked in a number of, with a number of teams and been somewhat siphoned off into the medical department, um, where I think that that's a location where the most psychologically safe conversations take place. You realize how many individual differences there are and that some players actually don't necessarily want that social relationship or yearn for that social cohesion. That isn't to suggest that we're not social, you social creatures. We absolutely are. Um, But not everybody yearns for that. And I would I mean, something that the you mess, um, 
mentioned towards the end of your dial uh, your your monologue there around um, where are the boundaries? I mean, I do think as a practitioner, part of the steps you have to take is is to work out, write down, intellectualize what your ethical boundaries are. What does best practice look like from that perspective? How do you conduct relationships in your uh, club environment and outside of your club environment? And maybe that should look detailed. I think that is what supervision is for. That's what peer conversation, peer practice is, is for. So I do think a, a part of being a great practitioner, no matter what your domain is, is to know and understand your ethical boundaries uh, and, and, and why you have those boundaries and, and to strive to stick to those. I think if we were to generalize here i think you can look at two things here relationships can be social and they can be task and actually contrary perhaps to the saying that you gave me at the beginning of of, of your piece there um i'm less convinced about that social piece i'm not saying it's not important but i am saying that there were a lot of athletes within a lot of environments who first and foremost want a task relationship they want you to be competent. They want you to have knowledge because I think first and foremost, that's what you're there for. And I think when you don't have that, no matter your social relationship, um, or it, yeah, it, it, it's going to compromise your professional relationship with them if you don't have good knowledge, um, if you don't have ethical boundaries, if you don't go about your work in the right way. Um, I think that that's, that's absolutely critical. And I think perhaps the foundation of your social relationship uh, certainly interacts with the task relationship and your knowledge. That's my belief. I think that's really, really important. I've been in environments where one might, and hey, look, some people might have thought about thought this about me, but where you sort of question the level of depth of the coaching knowledge, for instance. Uh, respectfully uh, in your own private world um, and that often rings true for players as well and they think well that coach doesn't really know that much and they're a great guy or they're a great you know girl they're a great person they're jolly they're fun they're all about the relationship meaning the social relationship but they don't know much about principles of play or the game model or they don't really they can't really articulate themselves very well or hold a competent meeting or it's just not good enough today that's not good enough today I, I think you need to have a good level of knowledge in my opinion and then I think you come to the social relationship and I, I think there is I mean I I orient a lot towards the great work of Professor Sophia Jowett and her t over 20 years of empirical research around the coach-athlete relationships and she has four C's don't test me on these C's Rob but the first C is closeness and so the closeness of relationship does matter you know do you like each other do you like each other uh, and, and can you find some common ground and and so therefore what I would say to a, a coach is to strive to find common ground within conversation that you don't necessarily have to take um the pe the players in your environment to nando's and have that kind of experience but probably what's important is to cultivate conversation where you explore commonal commonal commonalities and familiarities and right you know from other sports that we like and uh, bonding over Netflix and things like that that I, I I do think that that's that's important as well but that's not to the expen expense expense not to um, neglect that task uh, relationship um, as well I think a point to make on both of those I think what goes across social and task relationship again I come back to how are you 
how are you coaching? Are you controlled coaching or are you autonomy supportive coaching? Are you mixing the both? Do you have the capacity to co-create solutions? Because I just think that that, that is a, a, a mediator of social cohesion and task cohesion. You're asking questions. You're elaborating conversation. You're getting a feel for how you both see the world. Yes, that might be in within the domain of your sport but you're expanding on conversation you're agreeing on certain things on other things perhaps you're disagreeing or seeing the world through a different lens can you be skillful enough as a communicator to disagree um, but do so that uh, within a maintained social and task relationship um, how do you negotiate from that uh, perspective uh, I, I just think that that's where that co-creation is is can, can be so useful and again that's not to suggest that at times as a coach no matter what element that you're coaching um, that you can you can be the dictator you can say no this is the safest way to do this this is the optimal way to do this and this is why but there is going to be plenty of opportunity to go in and co-create and strive to see the world through the eyes of the player and take a snapshot shot of an understanding of their world and relate it to what you're striving to do with them. I think being sophisticated with your communication, being sophisticated with your capacity to co-create is all important across, across social and task cohesion. So in a nutshell, know your ethics, be damn knowledgeable so you can build task cohesion, find commonalities and familiarities and have great conversation around there to develop closeness and, and, and build a good co-orientation around, you know, your desired goals, you know, together, co-create. Love that. I, I don't feel as bad now for going off on the little monologue that I did given how complex we both know it is but it made me feel a lot better about that but Dan I'm conscious I'm conscious of your time because I've kept you for an hour and a half given that we had a, a great little chat beforehand you mentioned the books you mentioned the writing where can people dive a little bit deeper into your story into the content that you've got both free and of course paid um, and where can people find you on social media Sure. Well, look, firstly, Rob, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed uh, the conversation. We'd love to do it uh, again some other time because I think there's so many other things that we can dive into, not so least many. mental skills, which <laughs> I think S S and C uh, and and sports scientists etc. can 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 do some some great work there. Um, uh, my website is danabrahams.com. Um, I have an active blog. Uh, and you can find my books there which give you a link onto Amazon um, I've written four books Soccer Tough, Soccer Tough 2, Soccer Brain and Golf um, Tough Soccer Tough, Soccer Tough 2 and Golf Tough are really written for the player although coaches very much uh, read them but I wanted to write books that players would like to pick up and, and read so if s &C coaches, sports scientists out there feel like um they've got people players who would be interested there i'd like to think they're good books for that and even though it's soccer tough uh, it can the, the the tools and the techniques the philosophies in there are very much team oriented team team invasion oriented sports um i'm on social media a lot um, i give i would say 90 percent of my stuff away for free that's kind of what I do is my business model I, I trust that that's going to generate enough business so I give 90 perhaps 95 percent of my stuff away for free um, I have three Twitter accounts the main one is at Dan Abraham 77 um, that's where I'm doing most of my stuff and um, there's another one at Sports Psych Show which relates to my podcast Sports Psych Show which is a half decent podcast I think because I have great guests who have far more qualifications are far brighter than me um, so just google sports psych show and you'll find that and um, what else what else what else I'm I think you've mentioned it a few times I write on LinkedIn every day I've committed to writing 
something every day on LinkedIn, a post um, that I also put up on Facebook, which is at Dan Abraham Soccer. LinkedIn, just Dan or Daniel Abrahams. Um, and yeah, I, I, I stick it up on, on LinkedIn uh, and write about things that we, we've spoken about. It's always more articulate written down because you have more time to think about it. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I would love it if people uh, followed me on LinkedIn and get, in, get involved with the, the conversation on there. Um, so yeah, Rob, that, that, that's me. And I just can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to, to have a conversation My today. My pleasure. I'm, st- I'm potentially stitching myself up here because I think I'm saying the right thing. Did a player recently say that one of your books was a, one of the biggest influences on their career recently? I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, I was very, it was very nice of Gareth Bale. That was it. To, yes. To oh, just that. Gareth Bale. Yeah, in the guard. In the Guardian wow. newspaper, um, um, well, I, 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 another little treasure for me was seeing because uh, uh, who was it? Gianluca Vialli was interviewed on BBC Breakfast, and behind him was uh, my book, was his bookshelf, and my book. And I was like, I literally, well, I'm a sad man. I paused the screen and I, I went in nice and tight and close because I thought I recognised that. So it's always nice when. I think when you write for players, you're going to get realities. You're going to get some bigger players because there's, there's such sparse material out there for them. And and apart from in the world of golf, where there's about a million different golf psychology books, but you're going to get some players who read it and it's going to resonate with some and not others. And, and Gareth Bell said it was a slightly hyperbole question. What book changed your life? I'm, I don't know if it changed his life, but that's what he said. Uh, Soccer Tough by, by Dan Abrahams, which um, was very Love nice that. of him. So clearly, clearly that's why he is as good as he is. It's got nothing to do with his ability or his coaching. It's just to do with a random sports 100%. psychology book. But, but what, a, what, a, what a nice thing to, <laughs> uh, to come across and have said about you. Congratulations. That's, that's great. Yeah. Thanks, well, mate. I'll finally let you go. But Dan, thank you very much for coming on, giving me time in this afternoon, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Cheers, mate. Thanks, buddy. You take care.